Welcome to The Voice of Dunn Books. I'm Adam Dunn. This is where I'm supposed to say that I, it's a pleasure and a privilege to have with me, but I'm actually thrilled to be sitting here with Arthur Fallon Michel. He is the head of the Drone Studies Department at Bard College, and we are here to discuss drones and their trajectory, development, and the places they may be taking us. First up, what is your take on the report that appeared in, on the BBC late last year on the new Russian torpedoes, which actually appear to be drone mini-subs in their own right? The undersea space is one where drone activity is, is, is really heating up. Uh, you see that the, the ocean floor is actually really an ideal space for drones. It's big, it's empty, it's mostly boring. That's the kind of uh, place where you don't necessarily need to send down human personnel. You can have a, a sort of robot do your, your work for you. So it's not that surprising to see that this, this is an area where there are uh, rapid developments um, across the board in the internet, you know, internationally. Uh, militaries are, are seeing that this is a place where drones are going to be helpful in you know, surveillance, in anti-submarine warfare, in tracking enemy vessels. So it, uh, it, it, it definitely is, uh, is, is a place that I, I think you're going to continue to see uh, drones, you know, finding significant roles. But the drones which appeared in the report, and the report was surprisingly detailed, mm -hmm. uh, given that it was released to a news agency, which suggested the leak was deliberate. The report stated that uh, the Russian, the current Russian subfleet would have to be retrofitted to mm -hmm. be able just to carry and fire these uh, weapons, which were self-guiding and could be released at sea. Moreover, their purpose was not simply to obliterate a target, but rather to irradiate entire sections of a coastline. So this w suggested a movement beyond merely being a precision strike weapon. Rather, this was actually a weapon of mass destruction, which was a new chapter in mm -hmm. drone evolution. Sure, sure. Um, the Russian drone program is an interesting one. They, they came to the unmanned technology game a little later. By the time that Russia was really starting to make considerable investments in this area, uh, you'd already had significant advances in unmanned technology in Israel, the United Kingdom, and, and the United States. The a role that unmanned technology always plays in, in, in terms of the international stage is that they really are a way to demonstrate technological sophistication. They are the ultimate standoff weapon, in a sense. You can demonstrate that you have the ability to strike far and deep without putting any of your soldiers at, at, at risk, without incurring any significant political costs. So the, the fact that Russia wants to demonstrate that they have this capability, or wants people to believe that they have this capability, does, doesn't strike me as, uh, as particularly surprising. The, the announcement in itself probably is, is more an indication of sort of intentions or in, in, a, in an attempt to demonstrate some direction or some capability, but it also, I think, should probably be taken with a, a pinch of salt. Which is ironic given that the origins of undersea drone technology are civilian and more research-based rather than anything military. Correct. Sure. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, for example, uh, just um, discovered a new species of octopus using an underwater drone. Their remotely operated vehicle, the ROV, off the coast of Hawaii at a depth of 4,000 meters. This is an extremely sophisticated system and it's been doing terrific undersea work. Um, when you get to certain depths, it's so dangerous and the cost differential that it takes to put a human down there, say James Cameron, for example, um, is, is very significant. So it, it kind of makes sense to put a, a sub uh, down there. You also have uh, interesting developments um, in, in the smaller scale systems in this space. That being said, the, the Navy is, is really taking this, this segment seriously. They're showing real intention in terms of figuring out how best to use this technology underwater, particularly in their anti-mine 
sort of segment and, and they just cancelled a big contract with Lockheed Martin over there, anti-mine sub, unmanned sub. Um, and I think that demonstrates that they really want to find something that works and they're sort of going to do whatever it takes. They have a whole new directorate just uh, dedicated to unmanned systems. There's a very long history of civilian aerial drones developing in parallel to, to the military sphere. You see a lot of the real quantum leaps happening as a result of military investment. But the interest in remote control technology, the interest in using aerial drones as a remote sensing device, which is the same way essentially that they used under sea, um, has very deep civilian, civic, scientific roots. Now, who would be a major contender, or I should say competitor, to the United States in funding the sort of quantum leaps forward in drone evolution? Well, you have the recent news that the UK and France are spending two point one billion dollars to develop a stealth combat drone um, that they believe is should be ready by about 2025. Uh, this is a significant program. This is a program where they are hoping to develop a capability that delivers pretty much the, the performance uh, profile of a, of a fighter jet of today, but it's unmanned, right? And, and you're able to operate it from, you know, however many thousand miles away. Uh, that is one area of, of sort of significant, heavy public investment that is probably going to pay off. They have, you know, a, a range of really significant heavy hitting defense contractors behind that project, namely BAE, the British defense contractor that, that has deep roots in this field. Um, you're seeing lots of interesting developments happen in another of the usual suspects, which is Israel. Uh, especially with regards to what they call loitering munitions, which is a, a rapidly moving sphere, which is sort of a mix between a drone and a small missile. The idea with this is that the, you, you send essentially what looks like a drone up into the, into the sky and it loiters over a target for a couple of hours so that you can really pinpoint exactly what you're trying to hit and the best angle of attack. But that drone also has a, a small warhead inside of it. And then you actually fly it at high speed down into your target. And, and that's where it plays a bit more of the sort of missile role. Um, so some of the big Israeli defense contractors are making significant investments in that arena. Um, there have also been some recent announcements uh, that the Israelis are looking to improve their unmanned surface vehicle capabilities. That is boats that don't have you know, a captain or any sailors on board. Then you get a really sort of interesting mix of different uh, pretenders to, to the, the major leagues of, of drone development. Iran would like to have us believe that they have significant uh, combat drone capabilities with ranges of, you know, 500 miles. They claim that they're able to strike over the, the Syrian border. They have indeed exported a number of their smaller drones to, to some of their partners in the Middle East, but uh, the, the, their claims don't always necessarily match the information that we have about their systems. And there is reason to doubt that, you know, they do not have the access to the kind of communications infrastructure that's gonna enable really reliable, robust, low latency, long range operations, like the kinds that uh, are, are possible in the United States. And then the other obvious one is, is China, right? Which uh, has drone development growing, uh, as part of a much broader strategy in terms of building warships and aircraft carriers and subs and uh, bringing their army into the 21st century, but also being able to use that as a, as a bit of a honeypot in terms of foreign military sales. So you have Pakistan and Nigeria joining the lethal drone club, right, by conducting uh, strikes on their own uh, internal insurgencies in, in the last year. And the technology that allowed them to do that was, was Chinese. So the fact that China has 
already in a relatively short period of time got to the point where a team of soldiers is able to actually engage a target remotely using a drone with some form of guided missile uh, is, is pretty significant. The investments that they're making in the stealth sphere as well and combining stealth technology with drone technology in a way sort of similar to what the Europeans are trying to do is, uh, is, uh, has some probability of paying off. Now, how would one apply stealth technology to submersible drones? After all, you've got water noise, you've got obstructions, and you also have this highly sophisticated undersea sonar array mm -hmm. that's been in place for decades. Mm -hmm. So how would you make a drone sub silent? Sure. Well, one idea that the Defense Advanced Robotics Project Agency has is that the drone serves as a sort of forward operating detection device. So in, instead of putting your own manned drones in the line of fire um, in, in, the, in operation seeking to detect other enemy subs, you have a drone that sort of acts as an intermediary. It's an unmanned drone that allows your really significant, say, nuclear subs, the real capabilities to stand back a little bit um, and have that serve as a sort of relay hub where it'll detect the, the enemy drones that you're looking for and then relay that communication back to the much larger uh, nuclear capabilities that you have. Um, the, the, you know, you're able to have uh, less noisy um, vehicle if it's unmanned. It doesn't have to be as large. It doesn't have to move as much weight. Um, noise, I know, is, is, is a problem. The other, you know, option is that you hide the drones actually embedded in the sea floor. This is another DARPA project and, um, and have them sort of pop up unexpectedly uh, when they're needed. And, and that way you can sort of have them in hiding, so to speak, in a way that, you know, they're in some kind of, you know, heavy, you know, concrete or, you know, steel container. And drone things. sleeper subs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, drone sort of sleeper cell subs, and some of them really even float to the surface in theory and then actually do aerial operations. Um, A drone going from underwater yeah. Becoming airborne? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's one of the uh, ideas. So they call them upward falling drones. P.W. Singer in his book Wired for War, which I understand is on your syllabus mm -hmm. uh, to use here at, yep. at the college, uh, he did mention a direction of drones, actually a, a sort of miniaturization direction in which large numbers of very small drones would be used to mass over a target, he called it swarming. Sure. So what you're describing sounds like it would be swarming by land, by sea, and by air. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's and that, that technology is available now? Not at the level of sophistication that you, uh, they'd like to see it as used in the field. Right. Uh, so there are ideas to use swarms of drones that uh, fly alongside one of the large exquisite jets like an F-35 or an F-22 where the pilot is actually uh, handing off some of his tasks to these smaller drones that, that sort of fly in a convoy sort of situation. There's another idea where you have these drones, some of which might have that sort of loitering, loitering capability that uh, you know the Israelis are, are looking at, um, that come out sort of like paratroopers from a, a large cargo aircraft, like a C-130. Um, it's already possible to get a high number of small propeller-driven drones to behave in certain swarm-like formations. The, the Navy has been doing a number of interesting experiments where they, I think, last count were able to fly about 50, um, you know, single propeller, uh, fixed wing drones in, in formation. Um, they, they also conducted an experiment where they had a swarm of boats in, moving in a number of sort of complex maneuvers. Um, this is still a frontier technology. This is still an area where the, the basis, the reasons why it's appealing are already well established.
we know they're expendable, they're tradable, they are able to carry sensors, they're pretty easy to operate in theory, they can communicate amongst themselves. So the fact that we want these technologies is, is very well established. Uh, some of the challenges say, for example, with, um, with battery life, uh, you know, with how to actually keep them airborne for enough time that they'll be useful, you know, is another question. Or uh, perhaps being hacked. Uh, drone, aerial drones that were in use over Iraq, for example, mm -hmm. were known to have been uh, manipulated mm -hmm. by insurgents using relatively cheap Technology. I think the, the program was called Sky Grabber, mm -hmm. yep. uh, used to foil very large, sophisticated, expensive operating systems. Mm -hmm. So how vulnerable would these new drone technologies be to that kind of electronic takeover? The, the anecdote you're referring to was a bit of a watershed moment. It, it, it basically demonstrated that people are privy to some of the communications infrastructures that are enabling all these operations. And in the rapidly moving sort of networked internet age that we live in, it's people are gonna figure out ways of, of, of hacking into that. So what is more likely now is that there's gonna be a bit of a kind of push and pull cat and mouse sort of game. Each time there's a new uh, you know, swarming technology, for example, they're gonna be very conscious about making sure that the communications are well encrypted, that it's a robust system. But things on the other side move quickly as well. They are constantly figuring out ways of, of tapping into some of this stuff. On the civilian side, a, uh, uh, a fellow who now works at IBM just demonstrated that he was able to hack into a $35,000 high-end aerial photography drone. It's still a civilian drone, but they still like to think these systems are pretty robust. Um, no one sort of had any idea that this, you know, this, this, this particular vulnerability existed. When you're talking about systems that have that level of complexity, especially with some of the communication stuff, that there are gonna be holes. I mean, you think about the, the cyber, cyber warfare element uh, and how despite even the best efforts of, of the Pentagon and other government agencies, you still see breaches. Now it's been said that drones might render human combatants obsolete by taking them off the battlefield. Mm -hmm. What do you think would make drones obsolete? <sighs> Probably large scale devastating cyber attacks where you know you completely dismantle a, a country's power grid for example through a massive you know denial of service attack or some other form of attack that, that just sort of cuts all the cables you know nuclear weapons still exist and you know when a nuclear weapon comes into play uh, you know questions about infantry and you know on the ground you know strategic and tactical sort of maneuvers they, they kind of become moot because this infrastructure already all exists. Um, so drones do have the potential to render certain roles obsolete, it's true, but it's at a certain scale, right? At other scales, you know, there's, there's still going to be larger order systems, for example. If you just think about an aircraft carrier, right, and what it's able to do uh, and the sort of capability that it offers the president. The other element of the whole question around drones making humans obsolete is that if you think about the way the military works, and they talk about this, this idea of being in the loop, right, of having a human in control, they don't really want to give that up. You know, at the end of the day, the command structure, they're human. They want to put large order decisions in their own hands and still feel like they're in control of what's going on. It doesn't really make sense if that's your attitude to render yourself obsolete, so to speak. At a smaller scale, at a tactical level, yeah, sure, you know, you, you may not have troops in the line of fire, uh, but it is important to remember that, you know, even the, the leap from manned aircraft to unmanned aircraft required a pretty significant cultural shift within the Air Force. At the end of the day, these guys liked to fly airplanes. 
they like to feel the g-force they want to feel like they have a direct line of sight to what's going on and for them to relinquish that you know it took some time it, it, it wasn't it wasn't immediate and it wasn't purely uh, uh, you know reasonable to a lot of these guys they want to keep the fighter jets in many cases they want to keep things working the way they have done because th there is that accountability aspect there is that human in the loop aspect that, that it's just very appealing to to someone in the military so that's that's one sort of caveat i'd probably add to the whole you know machines re replacing humans part it it only goes so far up the chain of command Arthur Holland, Michelle, thank you so much for being with us today. It has been a pleasure. It's been wonderful. Thank you. I'm Adam Dunn. This has been the Voice of Dunn Books. This is Arthur Holland, Michelle, co-director for the Center of the Study of the Drone at Bard College. For more, you can visit their website, www.dronecenter.bard.edu.